good morning, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your breakfast. Who were here yesterday, I hope you enjoyed our keynote speaker, Susan. And the panel experts were amazing. And I hope you all enjoyed game night. I know I had a lot of fun. Go away! I am Carol Becker. I wear glasses. I have on a gray all shirt with blue pants. And I walk with a walker just because I'm not real steady on my feet. So that's where I'm at today. Hello. My thing with Tara Beer, I'm wearing a, a blue shirt black pants, I am a wheelchair, and I got a gray and black hair. So. We have a full day for the conference. We're growing and learning together. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping stuff. We can thank our sponsors and our, and we have more sponsors this year than ever, ever. We are so grateful for them. Okay. Um. Our first keynote speaker is about to join us on stage. But we'd like to go through some reminders just before we get started. First, some of the breakouts take place upstairs in the hallway behind us, or some take place downstairs by the bar and restaurant. We only have two elevators, so if you can, please use the stairs so the ones that don't have, that can't use the stairs can use the elevator. Please. Please be on to your sessions on time, because these sessions are being taped, and we don't want to have people interrupt the speaker when they're being, you know, when it's being taped. We have two sets of restrooms up here on the top floor, one out by registration, and one in the hallway back by the breakouts. Um, if you need more space, stop by the registration table in the hallway, and they have a key to a, a freshen up room that you could go and freshen up. Today we have lunch buffet starting at 11.15. We eat in the ballroom, so join us for our award ceremony and a panel of speakers. You can visit our vendors and sponsors at any time, but please try to be to break out on time. Some of them are being recorded. I just told you that. <laughs> I speed it ahead of myself there. That's okay. Okay, so we went through the housekeeping stuff. And the main thing is, is if you have any questions, please find Deidre or there are other volunteers working at our registration table. Now we have a special award we're gonna uh, give out this morning before we get started with our keynote. So I'm going to, to give it to Cheryl. Yes. This is our first year that, that all four decided to get the award to people that have been self-advocacy. This person been in our all for five or four, four years. He dedicated to been on many boards, just got on another board, a very important board, the DC Council. He we found out he is very organized in his stuff. Um, we are very honored to have to participate Judy Harmon Reward to who we can give it to. Darwin Heim. Turn around sure. if anybody wants to 
anyone say anything, Dalvin? Dalvin, would you like to say anything? You can take the mic. Take the mic. Uh, eight year, uh, five year, uh, uh, Odyssey. Good job. Good job. Okay. Thanks, Angie. Now you could go down. Okay. Now, I I am sorry about this here. So now I would like uh, to to introduce Terry Chase. She is not only our first speaker, but she is going to break out section. So if you expire by your talk, please go to her breakout session. Now, Dr. Trey bought her book and she can share it and she can tell me how to get one. We are not reading her bylaw because it is in our program. So I would like for her to give her a warm welcome, Dr. Cora welcome. Please come up to the, well, please join me. Welcome Terry to the stage. <laughs> welcome Terry. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, be careful going down that ramp. Good morning, North Dakota. Good morning. So my name's Terry Chase, and following the great protocol and etiquette of the people who are up here on the stage, I'm using a manual wheelchair. I'm wearing black pants and a white shirt. And I come from Colorado. But just last Friday, I was in Honolulu. Now, I want to tell you that those Hawaii people have this thing called the aloha spirit. Oh, yeah. yeah, anybody, who's been to Hawaii? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. But I tell you what, last night, I was downstairs in the bar with about 10 of your people, and you got the aloha spirit happening too. Now, I just want to let you know, though, okay, the strongest thing we had in the bar was chocolate milk. Okay, Seri <laughs> seriously, seriously. And I won't say who, who had that chocolate milk, but it was happening. So I want to thank, first of all, the North Dakota Developmental Disabilities Council for inviting me. I want to also thank the other, I think just two other organizations, the YES people, the YES SS people, and the ALL people, the ALL people. So you know what those stand for because I would totally mess it up, okay? So I'm not going to even try. But thank you, thank you. And I'm sure there's others. Deidre Hillman and her group, uh, the sound people, the, the production people, and all that. We need a little work on this ramp, though, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, we, yeah, I'm sure they'll be getting to it. All right, so let's get started. So let me get my, my things going here. Oh, whoa. what happened to my title? There we go. So I'm going to be talking about a wholehearted life one step at a time. And I'm going to be sharing lots of stories of my life living with spinal cord injury, the ups, the downs, and the all arounds. Now, I also want to make sure that you know, that I know, that I'm not the only person in the room who's had anything bad happen or lives a life with a disability or lives with some struggle, whether it's your own or a family member or friend. So I, I want you to know that it's all of us together here. And my message is for all of us today. So really what I want to do is I'm going to share my story, and I like to tell stories, of wellness and resiliency. I'm going to provide some interaction and some inter, inter, information for you. And if you choose to come to my breakouts this afternoon, this morning and this afternoon, we'll do even a little bit more. We'll take it a little bit farther. And then the last one I can barely read. Oh, I want to energize you. Because I really feel that the way to a wholehearted life is through, through energy. It's not rest. Now, I have a big boatload of background. I have three graduate degrees, nursing, spiritual psychology, um, and exercise physiology. i am also been a former PE teacher. So if anyone starts misbehaving, <laughs> what am I going to do? There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. People in Hawaii couldn't figure it out, but you guys, you got it, okay? North Dakota's got it. Um, I have a lot of work experience. I've worked, at, I am a nurse, and I'll share my story of becoming a nurse, and I worked at Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado, and then, 
Anybody know about Craig Hospital? Right on. Woohoo! All right. And then Colorado Mesa University, I just uh, completed my tenure there as an associate professor of nursing. Anybody gone to Colorado Mesa University? No. Why not? <laughs> all right, we'll be thinking about it. And then I do a bunch of other things, OK, which are all you know, in, in the bio. I have, so the disclosures, you know, every, every speaker has to say if they've had any financial um, uh, relationship with any entities. And of course, I did work for Craig Hospital. I just quit. Uh, I did 25 years with Craig in various positions. Um, so I'm done with them. But that's been within the last 24 months. And then I just left my position at the university. And for me to come here, I have my own business. So I'm just letting you know what those, re what those relationships are. Now, I think it's more important to uh, introduce me from my life perspective, OK, so that you know me as a person. So, the pictures I have up here on the screen are me doing the fun things. So you, some of you may recognize these. I water ski. Anybody you got water ski programs here in North Dakota? Oh, good. It gets a little cold here, but hopefully it warms up for like a week or two, right? Oh, OK. So water skiing, you do water skiing. I have a hand cycle. You got hand cyclists around here, I bet. I think it's really cool that the North Dakota Marathon is going to have a, a big adaptive um, piece to it. That's great. I work with horses. Any, any horse people here in North Dakota? Yeah, OK. I thought so. I thought so. I saw a few as I was flying in. And then I also do sea kayaking. So I also play wheelchair tennis. Any wheelchair tennis players out there or tennis players in general? OK, now that's a sport we might need to get North Dakota going on. Um, but I, I'm a lifelong learner. I love to read. I, I like to learn. I'm constantly taking a class or two. Matter of fact, last night, before I went and had chocolate milk, OK? Before I had my chocolate milk, I was up taking a test for a class that I was um, completing now. So anyway, I do a lot of fun things, which before, before I got hurt, I wasn't doing many of these things. I was doing some other things. So let me start with my story. The life before my spinal cord injury involved me being a middle school PE teacher. How many of you PE was your favorite sport? I mean, your favorite class. All right, good. Right on. And I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there. Math was your favorite one, too. But we, of that, I knew it. See, I knew it. OK, all right, good. So I was a PE teacher. I refereed basketball and volleyball. I wore the striped shirt. I went out and called fouls. I called you know, d different plays in, in the games. I also was an outward bound instructor. So I took students out into the mountains for two weeks to three weeks at a time. And we were camping, rock climbing, climbing mountains fording rivers, you know, making sure their tents were up in the night, and so on. And then I also was single. I, I, you know, I was a young 30-year-old, 32-year-old person. And I wasn't really into any committed relationship at the time. I was into a few relationships at the time, if some of you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but I really wasn't into anything real serious. And then I had my beloved dog, Shadow. So all of that was happening uh, before I got hurt. And then on April 2nd, 1988, I was riding a bike outside of my town, Grand Junction, and a man who was driving drunk behind me hit me. And all of a sudden, I'm on top of the hood of the car, and I'm thinking, this is really bad. And I could hear my bike being crunched underneath. And I'm like, OK, well, maybe, maybe it was happened so fast. He was going about 40 miles an hour. And then he swerved, I rolled, hit the ground, boom. I broke my back. And it's called a T12 incomplete spinal cord injury. So that means that you know you guys probably know where your vertebrae are. But if you take your last rib and go all the way around, that's T12. And T12, boom, burst. And so inside that vertebrae bone is the spinal cord, which is about the consistency of a banana. So it doesn't take much to bruise it. So I became paralyzed, incomplete para, uh, paraplegic at that level. They scoop me up off the ground in Grand Junction, put me in the ambulance, and I'm talking to the guys, hey, could you put some pictures on the ceiling of this ambulance? Because it's kind of boring. And they're like, you just got hit by a car. What are you talking about? <laughs> Seriously, it needs a little help in here. I think they finally just like smacked me to knock me out, so I quit talking. <laughs> After that, I was in um, acute care for two and a half weeks in, in Grand Junction at St. Mary's. And then I had the option to go to rehab. And rehab, how many of you have, have done some rehabilitation? You know, they're like, you know, yeah, they get you going again. They rehab us. They get us back to where we want to be. And the doctor came in and said, 
Well, you could stay here local in Grand Junction and be in a program where we have some elderly people. I don't have anything against old people, okay? I'm old now, so I don't have anything. I don't know, I guess. You could stay here. They do hip replacements, and they help people walk again, people with strokes, and so on. Or you could go to this place called Craig, Craig Hospital. And I'm like, what's that? He goes, well, they're more your age. They deal with spinal cord and brain injury and you know, all that stuff. I'm going there. So then I spent another two and a half months in rehabilitation at Craig Hospital in Denver, where I got to learn about a lot of things. But it doesn't mean that things were easy. There were lots of challenges with spinal cord injury. Uh, I was used to running, walking, teaching, riding my bike, hanging out with my middle school kids, refereeing and playing games and so on, and now I'm in a wheelchair. And it was really, really challenging. Physically, I approached it as if it was my next new athletic event. You know, like, all right, put some cones out. Let me go around the cones. Let's go on a hill climb. You know, let's do that kind of stuff. But, but the emotional part, the mental part, was really tough. I mean, as you can see, I'm kind of looking down on, at the ground, and I'm kind of, and this is really, this seriously, that was a, a 5K race when I was still a patient. My therapist took me out to the park and said, okay, you want to be athletic? Let's take you to the park and do a race. And I was probably thinking, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I want to get back to walking my shadow. I want to get back to being with the kids. Because being with my students was really important. Because just a month before I got hurt, one of our students, president of the student body, quarterback, good looking kid, decided to complete suicide. Yeah. And I'm like, oh no, I, I can't let my students be left with that's the only way out when bad things happen. So I was bound and determined to get back to teaching. Now, I'm, I'm a great believer in being inspired, inspired by. Who, and there are many people in my life who have inspired me. But I've also done a lot of reading. And, and, and when I worked for Outward Bound, which is the mountaineering school, the guy that founded that in the 1940s, he had a lot of great sayings. And he really inspired us to do the best. And one of his sayings was that your disability can be your opportunity. And I really took that in. He's, He's like, give me anybody. Anybody can do stuff. Let's, let's help them. So I took that on as one of my mantras, that this disability will be, my, will be an opportunity. And I will use this to help push me forward. So I had a few lessons, though, that I want to share with you that I learned across this time. So the first one that I, is, is called Take the First Step. And this, this is a picture of me water skiing. Well, I'm not water skiing yet. I'm waiting to be jerked out of the water, so to speak. But the way that I got into water skiing was I was still a patient at the hospital. And those recreation therapists, you guys know about recreation therapists. They're the ones that really help us get back into those fun things. She came to me and said, Terry, we're going to go water skiing. We're going to take this patient's water skiing next week. And even though you're not a big water skier, you know, I think you should go. And I'm like, sign me up. I'll do anything to get out of this hospital. So the doctor said, sure, you could go water skiing next Tuesday. So next Tuesday came, got up early. The nurses are like, here, have a donut and coffee and take your meds and put a blanket over you. Get on the short bus, because the recreation therapist, they have the short bus, if you know what I'm talking about. And they took me up to Boulder. And that water was like glass. So those, who's water skiers out here? Where are they? All right, good. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you. Okay. So it was beautiful. Well, so I go bombing down the ramp. It was longer than that one, kind of steep. Bombing down the ramp to the platform. And I'm on the platform, and I'm looking around for where's the water ski. I see a boat, but I don't see a water ski. And I said, where's the ski? And they're like, it's right there. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So there's two skis with a, a plastic chair bolted to the skis. And they're like, there's your ski. And I'm like, oh, OK. So I transferred onto that ski. They lowered me down into the water, which was really cold. They turned me around. They put the rope in my hand. And the guy in the boat said, when you stop bobbing, just say hit it. So I did. I hit it. And man, we took off. And we're going 20 miles an hour around Boulder Reservoir. Now, you know, I had two skis with a plastic chair bolted to it. I'm not going over. I mean, unless I did something kind of stupid. So I didn't do anything stupid. 
So I went around and around a couple of times, and I'm like, oh my God, I have a spinal cord injury. I'm not even out of my rehab hospital yet, and I'm on Boulder Reservoir skiing. But what, what that took for me to do that was inside, I had to decide to take the first step. Because a lot of times we're waiting for somebody out there to tell us what to do, or we want some opportunity to come about, or you know, we want to blame somebody for something. And really, you know what? It really is inside. It was the first step. Now, I really believe in, again, you know, listening to really smart people. Now, Abraham Maslow, so some of you might have taken a psychology class, and he's the guy that has the, the pyramid. You know, so at the bottom of the pyramid, we take care of our basic needs, and then we have our safety, and then we have all these other things that we take care of. He said, not allowing people to go through their pain, so not allowing us to hurt, protecting them from it may turn out to be kind of a protection, overprotection, which in turn implies a certain lack of respect for the integrity, for that internal strength, intrinsic nature, and future development of the person. So basically what Abraham Maslow, the guy that does the pyramid thing, said is that, you know, we got to go through our stuff. We got to go through our stuff so that we can grow. Now, there were many more first steps. You know, going water skiing wasn't the only one. I did go back to teaching. I was teaching middle school PE five months to the day after I got hurt. I went back and told those kids, yeah, I got knocked down. It hurt. I'm in a wheelchair now, but too bad. You still have to dress out and go run the mile, by the way. Okay? <laughs> And spit out your gum while you're out there, OK? You know, you guys, you guys have been some, having some good PE teachers. You know what I'm talking about. That's right, push-ups. And I would throw myself on the ground and do push-ups with them, too. Um, I wanted to live independently. You know, I was living by myself. I decided, you know, all those goofy relationships I was having, uh, I'm done with that. I, I, need to get, I need to get figured out and straightened out my own life. I got to walk in shadow again. Now, shadow and I were used to not doing any leash work. And that little black puppy that's walking around here on the leash, he's learning some good stuff right away. That's right. So I had to relearn how to walk shadow with a leash. I learned to drive in the Colorado mountains. Oh, OK, you guys have bad weather here, too. So I'm, you're, I'm not, I'm not going to make any big deal out of that, because it gets kind of cold and icy. OK, whatever. And then um, I realized that taking the first step really starts from within. I had to decide. Now, that, that, that picture up there of me refereeing? That took, a, that took a few years because I was really afraid that, oh, you know, I'm in a wheelchair. They're not going to like me, uh, you know, all that stuff. And I just decided, you know, I really like refereeing basketball. I like being in charge. You know what I'm talking about. So I was like, so I called them up. I called up the refereeing association. I said, yeah, you know, I've had 10 years of experience in refereeing. I love, I love the game. Blah, blah, blah. I, took a little, I took a little break. Do you have any games you need me to ref? Oh, yeah. Now, did you notice what I didn't say? I didn't say that. I just said, OK, I'll be there at, you know, Friday at 4. I show up in my wheelchair with my stripes and my whistle. They're all like, you know, look at me like, oh, oh. you know, they, they look but don't look. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. So OK, I go out there. Um, I toss the ball up. I have another official out there. Of course, you always have two. And he's looking at me like, OK, here we go. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, buddy, here we go. Throw the ball up, boom, the game's on, nobody, look, nobody batted an eye. Especially when I started calling fouls. They're like, ooh, she means business. I'm like, you bet I do. And coach, sit down and shut up. You know what I mean? I won't say anything about the parents, but whatever. OK, so it, it, took, it takes many, many first steps, OK? So that's my first lesson. Second lesson is I had to, I had to listen deeply. Now, this is in the Canyonlands of southeastern Utah. Uh, so basically what the picture is, is a canyon with some rock ledges uh, very high. This is, I took this picture. And I call this the edge of dark. I was out one time with my friend Al mountain biking. So it's a, it's a long drive. People mountain bike it. They drive it. They hike it. You know, whatever they want. So me and Al, he's the biker. And I'm, I was driving because I couldn't ride my mountain bike. I, I was paralyzed. So I would be his sag wagon. So Al would ride. I'd meet him in the evening. We'd camp. Next day, he'd ride. I'd meet him, at, you know, and all that stuff. So one afternoon, I'm by myself, and I'm at the edge. Literally, I'm at the edge. 
and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not happy. I don't like this. I don't want to be in this wheelchair. I want to be mountain biking with Al. I was really hurting. And I was like, you know what, I'll just, I'll go to that edge. And I'll get really close, kind of like I'm doing right now. Don't worry, I won't fall off. Um, and I'll just throw myself off, because I've had it. I've had it with this wheelchair. I'm done with it. I'm sick of it. I want to go. So as I'm like approaching the edge, some other little voice comes in and says, you know, if you go over that edge, you're going to be free for around 10 seconds, and then you're going to be dead. And I'm like, OK, well, all right, maybe I'll rethink this. So I backed up. And I decided that I really, really needed to have, a, have an opportunity to go to my deeper, deeper powers. What else was there for me to do in this world? So Joseph Campbell is another guy that I love to read. He talks about the hero's journey, which every single one of you in this room are on every single day. And he says, the opportunities to find deeper powers within ourselves comes when life seems most challenging. Well, being at the edge of a big rock ledge was kind of one of those times. And I had to really back up and go, all right, I got to listen more deeply for what is it I'm doing in this world? Now that I'm in a wheelchair, what am I going to do? What's, what's, what is, what's next for me? So I knew that there was something more for me to do. I, I had a strong internal drive to help people. I was helping my family. I was always helping you know, other people in my life. And I wanted to continue doing that. I had a curiosity, I had this little curiosity thing in my mind about what made me feel better. When I was a patient, something made me feel better. What was it? It was not the meds, it was not the treatments, it was not the bandages, it was not the, you know, all the other goofy things they have us do. It was something else. So what was it that made me feel better? And I wanted to find out. So it started me on this journey. And part of that journey led me to go to nursing school. So let me tell you, I didn't think about, I was in a wheelchair, and now I'm going to go to nursing school. I didn't think about that. I just was like, that's the program I want to go into. And it was called, uh, it was based on the theory of human caring. Any nurses out there? OK, so you guys know theory of human caring, Gene Watson, all that stuff, all your bad memories and all that stuff of nursing school, we can relate. So anyway, so I, I applied to nursing school not even thinking that it might be hard in a wheelchair. I was like, I just want to get there because I think it's about human caring that made me feel better, and I want to learn that so I can help other people. Well, I applied to the nursing school, and, and I forgot to put in I wanted to be a nurse in the essays. So they're like, oh, no, sorry, you're not accepted. What? What, what do you mean I'm not accepted? Was it my wheelchair? Was it me being in a Oh, no. You know, and of course, they're like, oh, no as their back step. No, no, go, go ahead and apply again. So I did. And I, I reworked my essays so that I said, yes, I definitely want to be a nurse, and this is why. And poof, I got accepted. Well, it was a four-year, 4,000-hour program, clinical, clinical time, plus all the classes. So halfway through, I became an RN. The other half was advanced practice. So the fourth year of my nursing program, my residency, was working well, it was being a resident, student nurse, at the very same hospital where I was a patient. Kind of blows me away. Here I am being a nurse. Well, I was a nursing student, you know, my whites, and I was a little scared. And I would go take care of patients in the inpatient program. Same room that I was in, 316B. That's where I was. I'm in there helping patients. So the first six months of that year, I worked inpatient. Second six months, I was in the outpatient clinic. At the end of that, um, I went to the director of nursing and I said, you know, nobody's paying attention to patient education. You know, they, they kind of throw it up in the air, whoever it falls on, they get the education. I've been an educator. I've been a patient in this hospital, I know what it's like. Now I'm a nurse, and now I've done my residence here. residency here. Is there any way I might be able to work here? And she said, great idea. She pulls out a piece of paper, and she starts writing up a job description. And it was the patient and family education coordinator for Craig Hospital. She's like, here, take this to HR, tell them you're hired. And I'm like, OK. I don't think they do it like that anymore. <laughs> I was kind of lucky. Yeah. So anyway, so I go to HR. I get a job. I'm, now I'm working in the same hospital where I was a patient, running the educate or developing the education program, because we didn't have much. So for 18 years, 
I developed the patient and family education program. I helped patients and families learn a lot more deeply. We held classes. We did fun stuff. We had you know, all kinds of stuff. I helped the nurses learn how to be better teachers. Well, one of the programs I did was um, taking our patients out to the horses, which I'll get to in a minute. But my third lesson is that through this, I was, I'm, I'm able to give back. So this is Bubba. And Bubba was uh, a 23-year-old handsome young man from Texas, a horse guy. And he, the only way I can describe his medical background, and his mom gave me permission to talk about this, is that he was all messed up. Okay, let me just say that. He was all messed up. He had neurological, you know, cognitive problems, brain injury kind of stuff, communication problems. Uh, his, his physical stuff was kind of messed up. He couldn't walk very well. He was kind of weak. Uh, his mouth was wired shut because, you know, I mean, it was, he was a mess. So I had a series of classes that every patient had to come to, you know, to be able to get out of Craig Hospital. Well, nobody, not too many people missed my classes. Because, you know, I'm like, what do you mean you're not coming? Get in here. So, so Bubba and his mom come into my class the very first day of his three-week, you know, education stint. And I went right up to him. Big energy. Bubba, I'm so glad you're here. I really want you and your mom to be here so that you can learn about your condition and all the things that will help you be better out in the world. And you know he, well, he, he couldn't see very well either. So he had these like foggy glasses and his mouth is wired shut. And, and I'm like, right in his face. I'm like, what am I doing? But there was something about him and me at that time that really made me do that. So he's, I said, do you get it? He's like, oh, you know, I mean, his mouth is wired shut. And I said, so you, you be up here right next to me. You're going to be my assistant. Because I want to make sure you're getting this, that we've got a good thing going while we go through all this stuff. So Bubba did well. He uh, got through all my classes. He did well in his rehab. He started making gains. Before he was discharged, though, I took him out to the barn, and we did a two-hour session with horses where patients could, could hang out. With, they got their own horse uh, with, an equine, with a horse handler, and they got to be with the horse. They got to groom them. They got to lead them. They got to lunge them. But they got to be with a horse and to know that they could be safe, You know that they know that their confidence of leading a horse, of being with a horse, would be something that they could take home when they go. Not everybody has a horse, but you know, you know what I mean. So anyway, so Bubba gets discharged, and about six months later, his mom calls the hospital and says, I'm sorry to report that Bubba has passed away. And we're all like, oh my god, and what? He was doing so well. Well, another complication, another medical complication sadly ended his life. So his mom said to me, she goes, I, I really want to let you know something. And I'm, all I could think about was the day I was Miss Big Energy. And she said, Bubba really liked you. And I was like, really? I'm really glad. I really liked him, too. He was a great, great kid. I loved him, actually. I said, and she said, you know, you made him feel, feel normal. I'm like, oh, that's what I did that day, that big energy. I want you here, man. I helped him feel normal. Because I didn't see, you know, I looked beyond the, you know, the, all the weird stuff, all the complications, all the messed upness. And I saw that there was a spark in there. There was a guy in there, a real guy, that was having a really hard time. And you know what? I saw that and grabbed it. So Gene Watson, who's, you know, the, the nurse theorist that I really followed and studied with and, you know, actually know her personally, she said, maybe this one moment with this one person is the very reason we're here on Earth at this time. So this is for all of us. There might be a time when someone in your life is just having a tough day, and you just go sit by them. Or maybe it's someone that you know you can call. They're there for you. Or maybe you get some big energy like I did that day and get in somebody's face and say, I really want you here, man, because that really makes a difference, big difference. So this whole giving back was an opportunity that opened up lots of new things for me. I developed all kinds of new ways to uh, teach. I really studied how I could expand my repertoire and my ability to relate to people and to facilitate learning. Because the root word of facilitate is facile, which is to make easy. Learning does not have to be hard. 
So learning, I, I want to make learning easy for people and fun. I also know that using my disability has helped others. I use it with my patients. I can relate to them. I roll in. Somebody's in a hospital bed. I'm right at their same level. I have not had one patient kick me out of their room. Not one. Not one. And sometimes healthcare providers are like, well, I don't know. People with disabilities who are healthcare providers, there's a lot of safety issues. There's a lot of safety issues with everybody else, too, so don't pick on us. You know, when I was in nursing school and I'd have those preceptors, those nurses standing behind me saying, how can she ever be a, wheel how can she ever be a nurse? She's in a wheelchair. And I'm thinking, you idiots, I can hear you. <laughs> my legs don't work, but my, my ears are just fine. So there's going to be a lot of doubters out there in the world, right? Yeah. So we just go on. We go, all right, well, they're dumb. I'm going to move on. I'm going to press forward. I can't read my little monitor down there. What do I got here? I share with patients, students, and healthcare providers about disability. You know, I, I just normalize it. Like, I get bigger than my wheelchair. Nobody gets to see the wheelchair until they first see me. I also expanded my world in my work in the world, and I discovered what made me feel better. So you're probably wondering, what was it when I was a patient that I was such on such a path to find? Well, what I realized was that it was the presence of those healthcare providers, that they were able to be there with me. And I would have to say, most of the time, it was the nurses, especially the ones with me at 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm like having a meltdown. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And those nurses just hung out with me. So it's about being authentic. It's about being present. And thank God the horses were there to help me learn that, because that was really after all these degrees and all this stuff. Finally, it was the horses that are like, yeah, man. We're just going to be with you. We're present. We're authentic. We're real. OK? So it's about that. That's what made me feel better. So basically, those are the three lessons. Take the first step, listen deeply, and give back. OK? So we're going to spend a little bit of time with those questions for you. But let me just ask you, just to kind of prime you now, for you to start thinking about you and your wholehearted life. So what are you aware of in your own life? And you can think about those if you, you can write them down or whatever, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on these. But just to get you primed, just start thinking. How are you attending to your stressors? You know, how are you attending to your stressors? Because we have to be aware of them. What level of support is present in your life now? Now, I heard, I've heard a lot about advocacy. And without advocacy, those who are helping you and speak for you and move things forward. And there's also a level of, are you being your own self-advocate? Are you stepping up in your own life? Because again, you could have all this stuff outside, you know, but really remember, it's about taking that first step. And really going forward, what would you like to create in your life? Now, I saw some young, young people. Are you guys high schoolers? What are you? College kids? Mid middles, they grow them big here in North Dakota. <laughs> Welcome. So you have an opportunity, you guys, to, to really take this in for yourself. What do you want to create going forward? Because what I found in another guy that I like to read is David White. He's a poet. And he says, the antidote to exhaustion isn't rest. Now, if you need a vacation, go take a vacation. But the antidote to exhaustion isn't rest, it's wholeheartedness. Can you approach your life with wholeheartedness? Like you're going to be present. You're going to look for opportunities to give back. You're going to take some time out to listen deeply. And are you going to take that first step? So we are going to take a few minutes now, because I do want each of you to spend a little bit of time. And I'm sorry, I don't think there's paper or pens, or maybe you can put it on your phone, or if you have a pen, you could write it down yourself. But I want everybody right now to be thinking about in jotting a few notes about taking the first step, where are you currently holding back in one area of your life? OK? So think to yourself. Either write it down, text yourself a note, name it. So what's, the one, what's one area of your life where you're holding back? Maybe you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Kind of like me when I, didn't, I was afraid to go, to go be a referee. Is there some place where you're really holding back right now? 
And then with that, what is the very first step you need to take? Okay, so think about that. Area of holding back, name it. And then what's the very, what's one little teeny, like micro step, one little teeny thing that you can take, action you can take. For me, it was I called up that refereeing association and said, hey, need a referee? I didn't say I was in a wheelchair. But that was my first step. Got that? Everybody got something? Or I can't see you. OK, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some nods. Lesson two, when you listen deeply, what do you hear and are not yet willing to listen? OK, so I'm just going to be quiet for a minute. It's, it's hard for me. But I'll be quiet. Listen deeply. So you may be hearing, and the second part of that is, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to listen to that quiet voice inside that's saying something to you? Let it speak. Let it speak. And you're like, well, nobody wants to listen. Well, you need to listen to yourself first. OK, so let it speak. You can jot a note on that. The third lesson is, Give back, OK? So this was the one about listening deeply and taking the first step. How will you give back? Because every single person in this room has the ability to give, OK? Every single person. So with your first step, motivated by listening deeply, how will you give back? Now, you might be thinking, who in the world can I give to? That's really nice. I would really en encourage you to consider giving, how can you give back to yourself? You know, how can you give back to yourself? Do you need to take a break? Do you need to ask for a change in work or in, in home care? You know, is something just, you know, maybe you need to, Maybe you need to ask your family to back off a bit. Or maybe you need to ask your family and friends to step up a little bit. OK? All right. So what I'd like each table to do, I'm going to give you a few minutes just to kind of open up a little discussion about, and, and you know, you don't have to like share your deepest, darkest things. But is there something that you can share at your table with your friends and who's with you about, you know, if it, you know, what, what's the one first step you would like to take? What, what is it? What is it? What's the first step? Okay. So I'm going to give you a minute just to kind of talk among yourselves a few minutes to do that. So first step, and how might you use that to give back? Okay, go. I'll be the timer. You talk. You talk. I'll time.
Okay, I just want to check in. How are things going at your tables? Give me a thumbs up if they're going okay. Okay? Going okay? Okay. So I'm just going to give you, I'm going to, whoever's talking, we can go ahead and bring that to a close. Um, you know, I also know that, you know, sometimes when I do my talks, people get kind of, you know, there might be some emotions that come up. You know, and, and I really believe that that's important that we pay attention to our emotions and we allow them to come forward. Because what we're really talking about here is mental health, which we don't want to talk about, right? It's all around us. Oh, my God, oh, my God, mental health crisis. But, well, I don't want to talk about it. Well, this is an opportunity for all of us to attend to our mental and emotional health. Because when I was teaching my nursing students and I taught mental health, I taught the class mental health, and all my students are like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to work with psychiatric patients. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm like, all right, whatever. You're going to have people with mental and emotional struggles no matter where you are in healthcare. And they, the students always wanted to say, well, I'm not like them. I'm not like them, all those, you know, psychiatric, really emotionally imbalanced people. I'm not like them. I'm over here. And I'd say, you know what, kids? Because I call them kids. There's this really thin line. And all of us, you think you're over here? Well, at any moment, any time in life, when you're not attending to yourself and you're not taking care of the things that are causing you stress and you're not asking for help or providing support to others, you can cross that line at any time. Because there's a spectrum of mental health. The mental health, you know, when we're in good mental health, you know, we've got all of our stuff going, everything's good, we've got support, we've got positivity around us, we've, we've got the support we need. And if we don't have that and stressors, stressors continue to happen, it can really move us to this side. So this is really about taking care of our own mental health. And it's not, you remember when I was on that edge and I was going to go over? That was, I was over here on that mental health spectrum. We have the resources within us to take care of ourselves. And you have to, you have to recognize those, okay? So I real and and also that there are people around you who will support you. All right. So anybody would like to would anyone like to share what's one first step you came up with? Tell us a little bit about what's the one first step you're going to take. Who's brave here? Okay, we got a gentleman in the far back with his hand up. With the plaid shirt, can somebody help um, help me? Do you want to do you want to tell us what your first step is? I'm not sure I heard that. We're going to get you a microphone. Thank helping others. Perfect. Advocate for yourself and helping others. Love that. Thank you. Good. What's another one? How about this side of the room? Anybody over there? Yes, in the far back. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love it. And the reason is... Um, we were talking about, and it really hit with this, most people on this table is being present in the moment. And the first opportunity in the morning uh, to be present and be there in the moment and not have your head a million different places yeah. is when you take a shower. Yeah. Just be present in the moment. Start there and see how the rest of the day goes. Yes, love it. And everyone around you will appreciate that too. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, how about this side of the room? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so her first step is to help people feel safe and be and not be scared. Anything else you want to add? Okay. And that nothing bad can happen That's so right. that everything will be fine. That's right. So, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Okay, middle school kids. We got any brave ones out there? What's one first step you guys are going to take? Somebody's going to come up with. Come on. I like middle school kids. Don't be afraid of me. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Look at that. You're facing one. To be more confident and outgoing. Nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love it. All right. You know, and I think, and that's just not just for a middle school kid. That's all of us. You know, to be more confident and outgoing. You know, make eye contact. You know, reach your hand out for a handshake or a fist bump. Whatever you're comfortable with. 
Anything else anybody wants to share before we move on? Colin, Got any others? Colin, Richard. Oh, go ahead. So you have your own voice. Have your own voice. He has his own voice. Awesome. Have your own voice. <laughs> All right. I love to see the connections in this room. I love to see the support of each other. That's the aloha spirit. Don't think that those Hawaiians are the only ones that have it. You have it up here. Okay. All right, good. So in your, in, I think in the materials, you got a co you'll get a copy of my, of my presentation, um, and then you can go to this page in, in particular and continue to work on this if you'd like. Continue to journal on it. Continue to reflect on it. Okay. Now, I do have a book, and it's called Spoke by Spoke. And Spoke by Spoke is a collection of my stories, some, a couple of the stories that I, I shared with you here. Um, and I, I didn't, this is one of those things where I held back for a number of years in putting this book together. I was writing stories, but I held back because like, I don't want to tell people what to do. I'm scared. I didn't have that confidence. And, all that. and finally I was like, you know what? Pretty soon I'm going to forget the stories. <laughs> so I got to get them together. So I got them together. I had some support to get you know, them edited. The guy that worked with me never lost my voice. He just kind of cleaned up my English a little bit. So it's a collection of stories that I can share with others, and not about just being spinal cord injured, but about the challenges of life. So Spoke by Spoke is available on Amazon if you want to get it, or, or bookshop.org. But I also brought uh, 30 copies this week for this week, and I'm going to give 10 away in each of my sessions. So there are 10 of you that I gave little stickers on your, my peeps, my chocolate milk peeps. Um, so if you have a sticker, the round sticker with a number on it, um, I've got a book for you. Okay, so people in the keynote session at the end, come on up and I'll make sure you get a book. Uh, I, I don't have time right now to sign them, but I will during the day. So I'll be here all day if you'd like me to personalize. If you do get a book of mine and you, you know, it was one of the prizes, um, I'm happy to sign it for you. Okay, don't worry, there's 20 more opportunities as we go. So that's my book. It's, I'm really proud of it. And, um, I know that it helps people. I know that it helps people, because people tell me that. And that's really all I want, is to, was to help, help people. So, oh, so poof, there, there's my 10, I, my gift to you. Now, thank you. Now, one of the things that I know really helps with my own well-being and my own mental health is to be in gratitude. So I am extremely grateful to all the people, all the guides, I call them some guardian angels, came around when I was hurt and through my time together, family, friends, mentors, my dogs. Okay, up there is Bucky, he's the brown one, brown and white one, he's got the red sweater on. And Shamley is the black and white one and Shamley and I are a therapy team. So Shamley and I are trained to go in and we go into hospitals, rehab centers, students and so on. And our mission is simple. Help people feel better. That's what we do. I do work with a lot with horses, and I have a partner, Sharon, Then we do a lot of outdoor activities together. So I really believe in the transformative power of relationship and the potential for a life full of fullness and grace and wholeheartedness. I really, really do. You can catch me on LinkedIn. Um, I've got a website. You can check me out there. But really, let's spend some time together the next couple of days while I'm here, or the next day. I'm only here today. Uh, and that's it. So thank you all very, very much. Here to bomb. Thank you.
thank you so much for your entire um, speech, Dr. Chase. We'd like to give a big, big round of applause to her, please. Before we head to our first breakout, please help me in thanking the Mobile Pro staff. They have been here since Sunday helping set up, and we appreciate them. Can we give them a big hand of applause? Okay, it's time to head out to our first breakout. So you can head to your sessions and try to be there on time and remember to use the stairs if you can and leave the wheelchair, the elevators for the people in the wheelchairs and walkers. <laughs>